The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. When Jesus was with the disciples right before he was crucified, he wanted them to pray with him. He found them sleeping. He said, why are you sleeping? But he said something curious. He said, don't you know Satan desires you? So he said, he asked them, why were they sleeping? And then he said, don't you know Satan desires you? Meaning, if you're sleeping, if it, that's what your ambition is, is to go to sleep when you're not alert, when you're not paying attention. That's how Satan gets you. When you're not communicating with the living God, when you're not thinking about Christ Jesus, when you're not consulting about your next move or the moves you've already made, that's when Satan comes in. That's when he invades your life, your thoughts, and everything else. But through a time of their lives when you were not thinking about Jesus Christ, then consumed you, and all of a sudden it turned you into an emotional wreck. Much instability in how you carried yourself, you could not find enthusiasm to do what you once did, all because your mind was not upon the Lord. Because if you're not thinking about the Lord, you're certainly not going to have confidence and trust in His resolve. You're going to try and tackle your problems by yourself and in doing so. That's how Satan gets you. That's how people end up devising these plans they should have never had. That's when he talks to people and he says, well, just go ahead and do this. You know, he puts thoughts in your head. If you do this, the whole problem goes away. Even though it's not nice, it's not holy, you know, could potentially harm somebody. Go ahead and do it. It won't harm them too much and nobody's going to know anyway and you'll be out of trouble. See, Satan will always teach you how to save yourself. Jesus will always grow you, raise you up and he'll show you how to walk in your salvation. He's not going to teach you anything that's going to save. That's what Satan does. Satan is the one when you're hungry, Satan says, feed yourself. When you're sick, he says, heal yourself. Too many people self-medicate. They do. They self-medicate. He'll say, fix yourself, heal yourself, feed yourself, clothe yourself, do everything for yourself. That's what Satan does. Your Father in heaven and Jesus Christ, they don't communicate like that. In fact, the Lord will often ask you to go the extra step in your calamity for the sake of somebody else. God always has a love call to his children. And a love call is not uh, selfish. A love call is selfless. That's where our Father is. That's a further way you can identify the enemy in your life. And I'm telling you now, once you stop drifting, he cannot get to you that way. And you'll never open a door into your life that will rip your family apart. Because any one of you who has gone down that road, you know for a fact it altered your family. You just don't know what the damage was. Back to Christ. Order followed him. Disorder is in the house of one who seeks. The one who is the master of disorder and chaos, confusion, and lies. And that's Beelzebub himself. Away from him. Trust in those simple things the Lord gave us. You'll be able to see why. Some of you think you would really get excited to see somebody from outer space. The truth is, you would be content and complete if the Lord showed you his creation. So then ask him. He already knows where. Who do you think made us curious in the first place? If God wanted us to find Christ, he would have to build us with that curiosity in us that we would answer the call. Because if we weren't curious, would we ever answer a call? Right? Like your cell phone. You can know the number and the person. They can call you. You might say, I wonder what they have to say. And if you don't answer, it's going to bug you to pieces. The Lord gave us these qualities, not to abuse them, but to lead us to Christ. And when you find Christ, you don't need to be led to him again. That's when it's time to follow him. Correct? Again, these meetings, they're going to turn some things upside down. And if you think the world is immoral now, you haven't seen anything. Because the more this topic is released to the public, the more the public is going to be convinced that they were created in a very different way than they have been taught. And when this takes place, they're not going to yield to conviction. And you know, most people, the people of the world, they hate to yield to conviction. When Jesus came in, in, in the book of John, right? I'll give an example of that. And I'll say it again. The world hates to yield to conviction. They don't like conviction. They want to do something wrong and have no one ever accuse them of doing anything wrong. 
That's what they want. They don't want to feel bad about what they did. They just want things to go forward. Well, let's do a case in point here. Jesus covered this. He did. He covered this quite well. I love learning of the Lord. I do. Because he was so simple in his teachings. Gospel of John, chapter there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time to his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I'm going to pause here real quick. Did you hear that? Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. This scripture is like a missing thing in in a lot of places because to be born again of the spirit is controlled by the living god as jesus described meaning if you're not born again of the spirit you can't even see the kingdom of god you'll have no part you'll be blinded right let's continue and of course to be born of water oh what is that what is water it's very simple i know a lot of people they have read this they said well that's baptism let me point something out to you jesus told a samaritan that he would give her water to drink that she would never thirst again what was she thirsty for knowledge the word and except a man be born of water right born of the word that means if you're born of the word now listen to me to be born of water is strange a little unless you're talking about baptism but i'll take it a step further if a person is born of water but that water is actually the word of god the words jesus spoke and to be born of that means you absolutely believe it. You're not sitting there doubting it. You absolutely believe it. And wouldn't you know it to be born of the Spirit and of the water go hand in hand? Because if you're born again of the Spirit, it's because on your own, you believe Jesus wholeheartedly. That's when you're born of the Spirit again. That's when you're like babies desiring sincere milk. But your spirit desires the Word of God. And when you begin to get the Word of God, you're born of that also. They go hand in hand. Do you guys see that? It's very interesting. When you truly believe in the word of the living God, when you honestly believe in that, you're born of the word. That means you're one with the word. You're not debating or arguing about it. You believe it. You want to live by it. You have fully ingested it. You have become portions of that word meaning. You partake of the word, your lifestyle to be born again of the spirit is up to the living god only it's not up to man we'll get to that though he says that which is born of flesh is flesh and that which is born of spirit is spirit marvel not that i said unto thee you must be born again the wind bloweth where it listeth and thou hearest the sound thereof but cannot tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth so is everyone that is born of the spirit you hear that the wind blows where it wants to and you can't tell where it came from or where it's going so is one born of the spirit you cannot tell dictate predict or do any of those things with one that is born of the spirit because that's under the father's control for the sincere of his word so when someone sincerely believes the gospel of jesus christ jesus will sincerely have them reborn and when you're reborn you have a brand new set of desires all that old stuff goes away you desire the word of god you don't fight with it you don't toggle back and forth between the world anymore because you can care less about those things of the world to be born again to the spirit is to have sight you can see what's going on god controls that no one will ever earn that you know, that's for the sincere of heart. Those are the folks who believe Jesus with all of what they are. They believe God with all of what they are. And when they do that, then you truly belong to him. And in that moment, you're really never alone. Then. You're not left to chance. Let's continue. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, yet received not our witness. He says, if I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Because it gets much deeper. And no man 
hath ascended up to heaven. But he that came down from heaven, hear that? Now he just said, no man has ascended up to the heavens. Not one, but the one who came down from the heavens. Isn't that something? So those specific prophets whom God touched big time, who did not see their death, no wonder. He says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's a necessity. Did you hear that? That's one of those absolutes. He says, and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He has to be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him or because or for the wreath or for that reason whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life he's saying the son of man must also be lifted up so that whoever believes upon him will have everlasting life for god so loved the world what did he love just his own children no the whole world for God so loved the world. Why, why is the world in here in the first place? Well, the same person Jesus said to love the world is to have enmity with God. Then why would it say, for God so loved the world? Because the world is full of darkness and sin. And the Father in heaven sent Jesus to be that ransom, uh, to pay that price. He loved the world. The world is full of sin. Your Father in heaven looked upon you with eyes of love because all of us were worldly prior being born into the fold before we said yes all of us did things worthy of punishment even death but the father did none of those things he simply loved us for god so loved the world my goodness what a merciful father he is because i have that statement in the bible means he loved those yes who were still in darkness who were still in high rebellion who were in the moments and times of fornication and adultery and thieving murdering individuals that's the world those are the traits of the world, but your Father in heaven, he loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son for sacrifice for all of those who would believe upon the name of Jesus. And to believe in him, that to believe in Jesus, right? If you believe in him, do you really think it's just believing that he is the Son of God? Nope, it's deeper than it. The devil knows that. Demons know that. They know he is the Son of God. They know who he is. So it's not knowing who he is. It's believing in him. And when you believe in someone, you support that someone. If I had a cause, and I said, well, C-O-T, I have this cause. I'm going to start. If you're behind me, just let me know and I'll show you what you must do. You'd have to believe in me to do that. Now, if you did not believe in me, but you like the people of C-O-T, you'd fight me and love the people. You would listen to a word I had to say. But if you believed in what I was doing, you'd support things that are done here. See that? Believing in Jesus is to believe in what he said, is to believe in what he stood for. And what did he stand for? He came to earth preaching the good news. He gave his life for a sinner multiplied by all who lived. You believe in that? Do you believe that Jesus is the sacrifice for the very one you're pointing your finger at on the right track? But you gotta stop pointing your finger. See, the same ones we would accuse that validates the reason for the coming of Christ. As I always think of those who have wronged me, it really does make me love them even more. Do you know why? Because if God sees fit to love them, then they're precious, period. My opinion doesn't matter. For God's love in my life. And so it pours out like that. But let me continue. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. Now this is very important to hear. 18 verse 18. John 3 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Yes, it's because if you don't believe in him, you don't believe in what he said. That is condemnation. Let me continue to read. He says, he that believeth on him is not it is um, believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he had not believed in the name of of the only begotten son, you see that? To believe in the name of someone is to believe what they stood for. How can I point, how can I not believe in the forgiveness of anybody, yet turn around and say, I believe in Christ? That is a, hip, a statement of hypocrisy. So if we condemn anybody, we're acknowledging that we don't agree with what God did for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See that? No wonder Jesus said, love your enemies. 
He didn't do that to force you to do something. He did that because he desires your soul to be saved. Because if you hate your enemies, your soul is in danger right now. To hate your enemy means you're not seeing the individual with the love of God, but with something else altogether. And you cannot step foot in the kingdom of God, harboring the spirit of a murderer, of an accuser. That'll never be. Listen, let me continue. Here it is right here. Here it is. I'm going to read 18 one more time so you have context. Here's the statement for tonight. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. And this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. That's what happened to us. Our deeds were reproved. We saw, he showed us our deeds. We saw our deeds and we said, no, I can't live like this. Lord, forgive me. Our deeds were reproved. Now, when your deeds are reproved, that takes an acknowledgement that's called repentance. There's the acknowledgement. Do you guys see this right here? But here's what I want you to see. In verse 19, John 3, 19, it says, and this is the condemnation is come into the world. That's the condemnation. The condemnation of what? That guilty feeling, the bad conscience, the conviction, the illumination of one's deeds in a bad place. When Christ came up, what was hidden? And what is it that's actually hidden? Iniquity. Our iniquity. Your iniquity. Their iniquity. And when Jesus came into this realm, men were reminded of their own iniquity. They could see it. And they did not like it. That's why Satan wants to corrupt many saints. About many reasons. He wants you to turn against Christ. If Satan were to ever near a person who believes in Jesus Christ, he's reminded of his iniquity. Cut some deep. When you come out of prayer, you've been reading your Bible, you probably went around people saying, don't judge me. You can't tell me that's wrong to do. You used to do it too. Well, that's not really the person. It's guilt talking. It is when you come around with the light of Christ within you, people start thinking about their own iniquity. The light of Christ shines in the darkness and the darkness comprehends it not. You know, that's in the Gospel of John. In the beginning was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It's in the book of John. And it, it, it says, in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made in him was life, and life was the light of men, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The darkness does not understand the light. So you'll, when you come out of prayer, when you come out of church, get around somebody, have a biblical conversation, and you're full of the love of Christ, one of the first things you're going to hear is, don't judge me. And when you try to speak to them, the rebel's going to be, you think you're perfect. How many of you have heard that? Oh, you think you're doing it all right now. For some, and the reason why they get like that is because they are still in love with the darkness they're doing. When a person loves, the darkness they do, they defend it. And when you come around, believers in Christ, you shine a light and you're not even aware you're doing it. It is the residue of the Messiah upon that word that you accept within you that starts coming out. Even before you say anything, your sheer presence can bring that conviction. And the other people start looking at you. And if you say anything about the Bible, they're going to start telling you, well, anybody can make it in. I just don't believe God is like that. Because if they are in love with the evil deeds they do, they continue to do them. And because of that, they're going to start hiding you when you come around, just as we did when we saw one of those real ministers when we were young. Remember that? I saw a guy burn his, yeah, I think he burned half of his behind off because he tried to hide a cigarette from a pastor and his pants started to, you know, not, it didn't go up in flames. It just kind of ate through the material. You could see smoke. I've seen people burn their hair. This one guy, I saw him put his hands behind his head with the cigarette lit like he was stretching and put a big, big blotch of hair burn up in the back of his head. That was, that was so funny. But people do things. They We did things like that when we were young. Why? Because in the moment when you really did like to go to the club, when you really did like to drink, when you really did like to do whatever it was you did, when a minister came by, you would respectfully dodge him. Why? Because as soon as they came by, you could feel the authority in them and you say, oh no, they're going to see my stuff. Let me get away from this. 
Let me let me not let him see me this. Let me get away from this first. Why? Because of the light shines in the darkness, which is why Jesus said you're a lamp. And a lamp is not made to sit under a bed. It's made to prop up in the middle of darkness to shine light in the darkness. That's what you are. Jesus said when he was in the world, he was that light. But when he ascended to the right hand of the Father, you became those lights. Having that issue with people, and they don't want to hear what you have to say about the Word of God, and they don't want to hear what you think of forgiveness and all this, they, they start justifying anger. They justify hatred against people and everything else. If, if, if this is just the way they do. But why? Uh, one smart thing to remember is this. When you were young in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you were resistant also. So in truth, are they, aren't they just younger versions of you? Aren't they on a path that you began long before then? That's all. So don't ostracize them. Don't push them all the way away. Just understand they're at a stage where they're still trying to hide things. And you bring out the light of Christ. Now that's very important. Why? Because that's a potential. Listen, when you get around people and this happens to them, you actually carry the light of Christ. You don't have to say a word. It's going to happen. Now, don't you think Satan would just love to corrupt that? How can Satan corrupt that? That a saint, that someone who believes in Christ, will no longer shine their light. How does he, um, you know, undo that? If he can get to you and corrupt you, you'll not shine a light. Be a child of the kingdom. And if he can do that, he can operate without, he can operate without impunity. This is the way he operates. If you can be corrupted, he can then enter into your home and rip it to shreds. He seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. So who's he going to go after? The non-believer? No. He's going after you. He's going to go after you. He's going to go after you through whatever you love, whatever's close to you. I hope you guys remember that. If he went through a stranger, not going to work too well. Who really cares if a stranger comes up and says, well, I don't like the way you look. You say, well, okay, have a good one. But if somebody in your own family, if one of your loved ones came to you and said something vile, it would rip you to shreds. That's what he hopes to do. By way of your family, by way of those who are close to you, by way of those you love. He's trying to get to you. Why do you think so many saints have the exact same complaint? Well, I try to tell my brother so-and-so, they won't listen. I try to tell my sister, they won't listen. Can't you see? Because every time you try to share the gospel with them, you're the one that walks away angry, not them. You do. And he's trying to get to you. So long as a person is not covered by the blood of the Lamb, whose heart is totally upon a belief in Jesus, Satan can get to them. And he does get to them. And they will resist the word of God. And then you walk away hurt. Why? Because it's personal to you guys. Anybody care to know how I survived those moments without a scratch? If somebody does not believe, well, first of all, when people try to give up on themselves, if you're one of those I have actually talked to in person and you try to give up on yourself, I'm not the one you want to talk to because I won't permit that. If he can snuff out your life, he can destroy the others. He wants you to turn against your belief in Christ. He knows you have faith. You're going to have faith in something. He just does not want your faith in Jesus Christ. It happens. And if it remains and you continue to follow Christ, you're going to be born again. And when you're born again, you're going to have a brand new set of desires and Satan will not be able to get to you. Note of something. When the disciples were walking physically with Jesus, he warned them. He said, why are you sleeping? Do you not know that Satan desires you? But then after Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, he didn't say that. He said, I am with you. That's what he said. And he asked me big time. See, when he was here on this earth, it was their comforter. When he ascended to the right hand of the Father, which is why he told them, if you knew where I was going, you would be upset. He was giving hints and they, oh, are you leaving us? He said, see, he said, if you truly understood, you would have a lot of joy, but you don't understand. They couldn't get it. And so in Acts, he said, don't depart out of Jerusalem until that the promise has come. But he never told them again to sleep because this time, even if they were to sleep, the Holy Spirit is still with them. Jesus is still with them. Whether they be awake or asleep, Jesus is still with them. And may I remind you about the 10 virgins? Yes, there were ten, uh, five foolish, five wise, but all of them are sleeping. 
my goodness. Every single last one was sleeping and five still made it through. Do you see that? So the sleep factor, that's not a very big factor now, is it? So whether you be awake or asleep, love is upon you. Satan doesn't like that either. He wants you to put out your light because you can affect too much. He wants you to get out of the way so he can spread. And it's almost like a virus where people don't care about their darkness. And have you noticed something in the last five years? People don't care about their darkness. Why do you think the world has legalized so many abominable things? And when people see it legalized by law, they think it's okay to do it. But it's not. I should tell you something about the rule of law. You know, it's like working for, whenever you work for someone, right? And I've done, I, I've done this every time I work for someone. There's a SOP you follow, standard operating procedure you follow for just about everything. There is a standard for your clothing, your conduct, and all those things. I always went above and beyond. I will never do bare minimum only because the Father called us higher than that. We always give an extra oomph. That's why he said if someone asks of you, for you to go with them one mile, Jesus said go with them too. If they ask for your coat, give them your cloak also. He always encouraged us to go above and beyond. Someone would request of us always. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. This word is defined, by the way. To do something evil is when you're really doing something against your fellow man. You're assisting or complicit with another person's murder. Complicit with corrupting somebody else. So everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. They don't like the light. They don't like that when, when, when things are said or spoken, right, that contradicts possibly how they're living or whatever the case is. They don't like that. Why? He explains it. He says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light. Lest his deeds be reproved, that's repentance. He said, But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, or wrought in God. Did you see that? That his deeds might be made manifest, that his works have an origination of the living God, which, by the way, takes time. In the Gospel of John, though, one of the, the, the point scripture here, the condemnation that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because his deeds were evil. Now, in Daniel, in the book of Daniel, when these things are mingling their seed with the seed of men, there's only one way they can get to you, and that's before the age of accountability or in the time where you have slipped back away from the living God. That's the only time they can ever get to you. And so they wait for it. They wait for you of the path of Christ. And then they pounce. And if you think by your power somehow you can overcome them, you're wrong. Only by the power of Christ. And that is through the way we live. Things, though, they're not slowing down. They're speeding up. They're after people. And you can put a halt to it in people's lives. You can really disrupt darkness in someone else's life. So I have a small piece of uh, encouragement here. Take note of those people that irritate you the most, that you know have sided with the devil, and find it within yourselves, not to have dinner with them, but to forgive them fully. You know when you have forgiven someone, when you start hoping for them, you know, it's like seeing somebody, they're doing all bad stuff, and you say, I certainly do pray, Lord, that that person can soon see that you can raise them up like you raised me up, right? Instead of saying, well, look what that person's doing, that's evil. See, we already know that evil is everywhere, God is not. God inhabits the praises of his people, no praise. Then is God present, based in the spirit. If he inhabits that, then where you find no praise, you're not going to find God the Father's presence there either. It's very simple. And all of you who, be who believe upon his name, regardless of what you're doing, please hear me on this. Please don't be fooled by Lucifer. If you honestly believe upon his name, Jesus will perfect the work he began in you. We can't perfect it. He will. He will finish the work he began in us. He will. The Bible says he will, not us. He will.